Well, brothers and sisters, welcome to CMJ Canada, to Canada House, and to the Torah portion that we're studying uh, today. We've gathered in the name of the Lord. Doesn't matter where you're from, doesn't matter who's listening, if you're listening on, on podcast, it's the same spirit that actually unites all of us together. And that's actually a great treasure and a blessing. And so let's pray and uh, bless the Lord and, uh, and, and also this holy time that we're engaging in. Father in heaven, Lord, we gather in your name around your word. Your word is light. Your word is life. Your word is truth. Your word is Torah. It is teaching, guidance, and instruction for us. Your word is a lamp unto our feet. We pray, Lord, that the light that you kindle in us, we will have such passion and, uh, and, and love for you that we will share it. We bless your name for the gifts that you have given us. B'Shem Yeshua, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So the, there are two passage portions of Torah that we're going to be looking at. One's called Shoftim and the other's called uh, Kitetse. One, the, the first one is about is, is entitled The Judges, because that's the way the portion starts. The other one is When You Go Out to War, implying that you will go out to war, which is an interesting thought, isn't it, for the people of God? It's not if you have to fight as a last resort, it's when. Interesting thought. And uh, that if that's true for us as the people of God, then uh, what sort of warfare are we actually engaged in? Not if, but when. Anyway, let's, let's uh, think about the context here again about our hero Moses. Moses has... Uh, been with the children of Israel for 40 years, and he's learned a thing or two about the people of God, and he's giving his the, his last last pep talk before they uh, journey into the land of Canaan to set up um, the holy nation of Israel that was meant to be a light to the nations, meant to be a just society. And so you end up with a lot of details and laws about every aspect of of the community how you deal with the land, how you deal with your slaves, how you deal with your judiciary. Uh, today, we're going to hear, talk about how you deal with administration and a whole bunch of other little things, big laws, little laws that covers every aspect. And um, as they say that uh, the devil's in the details, God is in the details at exactly the same, the same time. And um, so what is it about Moses's characteristic that allows him to uh, lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. It's, um, it's a question that Jewish people ask because they look at the initial character of Moses and they discover a, a very flawed figure. Right? He has a miraculous birth story. Yes, we all know the little baby in the, in the little boat through the Nile. And, and it's, it's, it's a miracle. He's, he survives and he ends up in, in uh, the palace of the daughter of the Pharaoh right the enemy that's trying to kill you and you end up with him that's pretty miraculous and then he grows up now what's interesting about the the, the text uh, about in exodus it doesn't say that he became a prince of egypt right we assume that right because it, when he actually goes out to meet people, they say, who made you a judge or ruler over us? Well, if he was a prince of Egypt, that's a really dumb thing to say to someone. Um, we also discover that um, uh, he, he, like, he runs away, he commits murder. He's got anger management problems, commits murder. Uh, he buries the body. When he's discovered, he runs away. And he then spends 40 years not returning to Israel. Uh, where he marries um, a foreigner, and then and then it says he was guarding the flocks of his father-in-law Jephro. So he's a failed businessman. After forty years, still hasn't got any flocks of his own. So you sort of scratch your head and go, "Oh my gosh, Lord, what exactly, what quality are you really looking in your hero here?" Um, and and the 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 thing that Moses has, and that he actually is is bringing out into Deuteronomy is compassion. When did he get compassion, I hear you ask? Well, there's a story, a midrash, and a midrash is a, a literary device, a story that's not true, but that tells a truth. 
Okay, and so the story is this. Moses is watching his flock, well, the flock of his father-in-law, and one little sheep gets lost. And Moses abandons the others, and he crawls through the rocks, and he scuffs his knees, and he crawls through the briars, and he scuffs his elbows, and he's all cut and bruised. But he's not going to give up looking for this uh, silly little lost lamb. And then finally, when he finds the lost sheep, he bends down to pick him up, and then behind him, a bush catches fire. Because God says, aha, my hero is ready. He is, uh, he's, he is, um, uh, he has compassion for the lost and the weak. He had done, he's done all kinds of crazy stuff. That's true. But his, the, it's compassion that God is looking for in, in heroes. And that's what you see in Yeshua, in Jesus. When, whenever he was tired, he'd sent people away. Um, uh, he was looking for a place on his own to go and rest. The crowds followed him, and it deliberately says, he saw them, and they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he had compassion on them. So that's the sort of, sort of link there. Anyway, Moses now has compassion on his, on his people. He's been with them for, four, for 40 years. He knows their weaknesses. He knows their strengths, and he knows that when they go into the land of Canaan, in their success, they'll fail. Right? They're going to win, and they're going to capture territory. They're going to live in houses they didn't build. They're going to drink from vineyards they never planted. And in their success, they'll abandon the Lord. He's trying so hard to make sure that they, that they won't forget the living God. And if we're honest, we can also look at our own cultures and we can say, look, we 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 got we became successful. We're wealthy, we've built great cities, and we've abandoned the Lord and uh, no longer looking after the lost and the weak, etc. And no longer looking after the land, which is going to also be a big theme in, in many of the laws today, how you actually take care of the earth. Which, if we remember from Genesis, God has um, blessed us with partnership. What do I mean by that? Well, God made the, made the world. Absolutely. He's the king of the universe. Absolutely. And then yet he turns around to me, a human, and says, now you have dominion. I've got dominion, but you have dominion. So he shares, he shares his, his love of the earth. He shares his care and guardianship of the earth with with a human, uh, and that's a, a, a privilege. So how does Moses want to look after his people? So in today's initial Torah portion, which starts at um, chapter 16, 18, God, uh, Moses says, appoint judges and officials. So start getting your administration figured out. You know, you can't just... Leave it to uh, to what's the phrase we see in the book of Judges? Every man shall do what is right in his own eyes. Now, that verse appears many times through the book of Judges, and it's always in a negative sense. It's not something that the Bible is celebrating. Oh, everybody's doing what is right in their own eyes. Let's get to a society that looks like that. That's not um, um, something positive. Because the way that God, uh, that Moses would like to prepare his people for the Holy Land comes in, uh, in this section. So the, uh, the, the appoint yourselves a, a, a justice system so that justice will be done. And so somebody's got to oversee, oversee this, this justice. And immediately he then tackles idolatry again, right? That uh, don't when you if you're going to uh, worship the Lord, then don't give him the second best. He when if, if you're going to bring anything to the Lord God, then it must be without a blemish. It's got to be perfect. It's not that you you go to church or to worship and you just give him what was in your pocket because you forgot to actually take an offering to the Lord. Right? It's if you're going to worship the Lord, then worship him properly, not with your second best, not with an off thought, not with 
uh, uh, anything other than the the this, because that's who God God is and who He should be, should, what He should be reflected by. And uh, and then, um, which is an interesting thing to break because you break up your administration to turn around and say, make sure you're, you're giving God your, your 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 best. Oh, and by the way, our judges are going to make sure you do. And uh, uh, and then uh, it the the part of the judicial system is to make sure that you also have witnesses that you have an honest judicial system. This is a problem for most of the world, actually, because we all create judicial systems and then they all become corrupt. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, everyone's subject to bribes. Everyone's subject to well, you, you only win uh, based on the good quality of your lawyer, uh, which is very unfortunate. Um, that that is a system that 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 ends up happening. Um, uh, the the uh, the the initial goal of the people of God was to have an honest judiciary, and and um, one of the things that is involved in the honest judiciary is the priests and the Levites. Is that the if you have a look at verse seventeen, verse nine. The, the Levitical priests, the Levites, they are to be your judges. So who's involved in administration? The clergy. Who's involved in taking care of the people? Those who also have spiritual welfare. So that means they're not divorcing the spirit from the law. Like We often, in our societies, we like to separate church and state. Right? Let's keep the church and the state separate. Well, they say you can't do that. Moses is saying yeah, that's not that's not possible. Because if you actually want to have just moral laws, where do you get your morality from? Right now, we we we've many of us can remember um, when they took the Ten Commandments out of courtrooms. Right, you know, they and you're like, well, well, what's your real basis then? Who's making the actual law? What act? Who's deciding who's right? And who's wrong? And is that just voted on by the majority? Because if that's true, then we can quickly get to what's called the tyranny of the masses, where 51% of the people decide that um, cannibalism is perfectly legal. 49% right? of the people, the ones we're eating, they say that's not fair. Okay. Um, but so, but what happens if we have the opposite? What happens if we have tyranny of the minority, which we're in at the moment, where a small group of people decide, well, I've got rights, you know, and uh, and uh, you just all have to do what I say. And so where's the actual balance? And the way Moses says, he says, actually, make sure you go talk to a priest. Make sure you you have somebody who's familiar with the Torah, or they're supposed to be. So what is Moses trying to set up? He's trying to make sure that the teachings and the guidance and instructions of God are not removed from the community. So they're part of it. They're an integral part. They're, there's going to be a, a facet in, in, in every part of your, your, um, your uh, system. And as well as, as having a uh, judiciary, you need to have an executive. You need to have your executive branch. Who should be your executive branch, I hear you ask? Well, let's have an absolute fantastic democracy. No, that's not what Moses says. Moses has looked at the people of God for 40 years and he's worked out, oh, there's no way we're going to give you guys a vote. Okay, you're an absolute basket case. So if you look at Deuteronomy 17, Moses is now going to say something unique that he hasn't said before. Moses in, in, in 17, uh, he's going to talk about the king. And he says, when you enter the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you have taken possession of it and settled in it. Now, God is going to give the people of Israel the land. Okay, great. Who's actually going to take the land? Do they just walk in and it's empty? No. They're going to have to fight for it. You will. God, God is giving you the land, but it doesn't come without a struggle. 
Okay, and that's an it's a very interesting thought for everybody's life. Many of us, many of us, and many of the people that uh, we disciple here, um, they think that now that I'm become a believer in uh, in Jesus, now that I have the Holy Spirit, it's all wonderful. I'll have no problems at all. Actually, no, it's your faith and uh, and the Holy Spirit that's going to get you through your troubles, right? And it doesn't mean you have them. And so even to, even taking possession of the land, which is from God, which is a blessing, which is a promise, still comes with struggle. And in, in un unfortunately, it's going to come for the people of Israel. It's going to come with armed struggle. So many of the laws in our portion today are actually going to deal with warfare. Like what do you do? when you go out to war and uh, that that's, that's a theological struggle for, for many denominations. Um, uh, but we'll talk about that when, when we, when we get to it. So how are we forming our, our, our judiciary? I've done the judiciary. It's going to include God. How do we include, what do we do for our uh, executive branch? Well, uh, when you come into the land, take possession of it, and you say, let us set a king over us, like all the nations around us, be sure to appoint over you a king that the Lord your God chooses. So what's going to be the form of government? It's going to be a monarchy. Now, that scares the pants off about 99% of the people listening to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay um because we live in or we most of us live in democratic countries and we think democracy is a fantastic invention uh but let's remember democracy actually comes from the pagan world right it's a greek invention and uh and, and it has it has blessings but as a system, it also has flaws. It's both, just as monarchy, just as they all have benefits and they all have flaws. But at the end of the day, the Lord, the Lord God, through Moses, who's introducing something new, says, guys, you need a king. And what type of king do we have? Do we have this absolute monarch who, who does whatever he wants and uh, he has no checks and balances actually what you're going to find in this passage you have a limited monarch and he has to do something very special now there are 613 laws that everybody gets but the monarch only gets a few laws so let's have a look at what laws he gets so uh, Moses tells people they need a king because they, they, uh, he knows the heart of these people are rebellious, and if left to their own devices, everyone will do what is right in his own eyes. And that's what happens in Judges, right? What you see here is Moses says, set up a king, and when they get into the land of Israel, they don't set up a king. They actually disobey this rule straight away, and you end up with a period of Judges, and it takes, takes time to get to a king. Now, who's our first king of Israel? It's Saul. And uh, while he also has many character flaws, and uh, a lot of people give him a very bad rap, you know, bad king, bad king, bad king, that's all we can think of. Um, he actually has some characteristics that are very positive. So, for example, how many wives does he have? He has one. How many wives does King David have? He's got 18. Oh, there's a bit of a difference there. Okay. Um, King David doesn't go out to war, stays home, and ends up having an adulterous affair and kills one of his friends. Right? Uh, Saul was so desperate to talk to God, because God had, had stopped talking to him, that he, he summoned up uh, Samuel from the dead using a, a witch and when he talked to samuel now this is not a good thing but he was so desperate to talk to god he did something really really dumb samuel said tomorrow you're going to go out to war against the philistines and you're going to die you and your sons now if 
you'd received, let's just say Doris had received a prophecy from some dead prophet. I mean, Samuel is the only prophet who actually prophesied after he's dead. That's a unique little quality of that hero. Okay. But imagine if, if uh, uh, someone said to Doris, uh, Doris, you're going to leave your house tomorrow and a big red bus is going to, to hit you. Guess what Doris doesn't do? Doesn't leave the house, okay? Stays home, makes a cup of tea, listens to a podcast, calls the family and friends on Zoom, right? But, but, but Saul has been told, tomorrow you go out to battle and you die. You don't win, you die, you lose. Now, instead of going, okay, guess I won't go out to battle. I'll wait till when I do win. He has to go out to battle because he's the king of his nation. And so he has to do his job. So there's, there are, he has some, some positives as well as some negatives. And so the, 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 the Jewish sages will always look through the Bible and they'll find, find things that are positive and negative and try and learn from them. And, uh, and so here you have Moses looking at, at his people and saying, you guys, you need a king. And we better work out what type of king we're going to have. So uh, be sure to make sure that it's the Lord's anointed, not the one that you choose. It'll be the one that God chooses. So you end up with the idea of kingship, which is going to lead to King Messiah. Jesus is a king. He's not the duly elected Jesus. It's not that we all sat around on Sunday one day and took a vote and went, yep, he's the Messiah. And it's he's a king. And kings, by default, get the right to tell you what to do okay and so jesus jesus gets the right by default because he's king to tell us what to do okay and now he must be from your fellow israelites okay he can't you can't just elect a foreigner okay it's got to be from one of from from, from in-house so jesus as we know is jewish right he is an israelite do not place a foreigner over you uh, who is not from among the Israelites. The king, moreover, these are some of the things the king is not allowed to do. So what we do is we limit monarchy. We don't have absolute monarchy. We've got limited monarchy. The king must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself right? or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has said, you are never to go back that way again so what does he do he's not allowed to have a big army that's what it means by not not a, not lots of horses because the horses and the chariots those were like the main battle tanks uh, of of the day if you had cavalry you actually dominated uh battlefields so what does the what does the king not have doesn't have a big army which means he's not expansionist Right, your your king is just to rule over Israel. It's not to rule over Assyria. It's not to rule over Egypt. They have their own kings. Okay, you've got your king. They got their king. Is yes, everybody should be happy. So what what the, the 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 God is saying is have a king, but make sure he's not expansionist. Stop trying to take over other people. Right? That uh, and so no big armies for you. Uh, which would solve a lot of problems if all of our governments only had small armies. And unfortunately, bigger is better, and that's all we can think of. So he must not take many wives, uh, or his heart will be led astray. And he must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. So how do you protect your king? Well, first of all, you don't give him lots of wives. Now, why didn't we just say only have one? That would have made very nice modern-day sense, uh, but the Bible isn't. Uh, written in the modern period and back then um, as in some cultures today uh, people make diplomatic uh, marriages and so the, the the limited monarchies don't make too many diplomatic marriages okay? just just keep it to a few you, you might need to make friends with your neighbors that's great you know make peace with lebanon make peace with jordan make peace with syria um but uh keep, keep it keep it to that right just just in your in your your region, and uh, don't try and get too too wealthy, because uh, often in our wealth um, we forget who God is, and start to think that actually um, we don't don't need Him. And then if you actually have a look at this, uh, these these limits, 
not many horses, don't go back to Egypt, uh, don't take many wives, and don't get much silver or gold. Who's the king who broke all of those rules? King Solomon. Right? The king who we always say is the wisest of people is also the dumbest of people. Right? He, he did the complete opposite to everything that a monarch was supposed to do. So he went back to Egypt, he got horses, and he married an Egyptian princess. That's a, that's a problem right there. He had over a thousand women. Why? I don't think anyone's going to be able to answer that question. Uh, but he was also one of the richest, and it did not help. And uh, which is interesting, isn't it? That people often pursue wealth thinking that that's the answer to everything that there is in life. And, uh, and, and straight away, Moses is saying, it's actually, it's not. Um, it's great. I'm not saying that it's not a blessing. That's not what we're not saying. Just don't, don't, sometimes, don't look sometimes for too much of, uh, of the blessing. This is for the monarch, right? Uh, that doesn't mean that wealthy businessmen can't get rich. Right, but what they're doing is they're trying to make sure that the monarch is not too powerful. You have you have a, you have a king, but he's a limited king. All right, so these are all the things he can't do. So what is he supposed to do? He's got to do something. And then so when he takes his throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of the Torah, taken uh, from that of the Levitical priests, and it is to be with him. And he is to read it all the days of his life so that uh, he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of the law and these decrees and not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites and turn from the Torah or the teachings and the instructions from the right or the left. Then he and his descendants will reign over a long time over the king of Israel. So this sort of, this sort of longevity is linked to uh, to obedience. So what does the king have to do? He's got one law. He has to write a copy of the law, his own copy. He does, not, not the priests. Right? So, the, so uh, Moses looks at the people of Israel and says, okay, you're going to need a king, and I'd better help you. And uh, But the way we're going to do kingship here we're going to take away a lot of his power, and we're going to make sure that he keeps the words of God front and center. That's how he's going to rule the people. Your, your judiciary is supposed to be doing this, and now your executive is supposed to be doing this. So the country, the society that Moses is trying to prepare the people for is one that is based on the Bible. Simple as that. So the king is supposed to ascend to the throne, long live the king, he writes the copy, and as he's learning the words of God, he's going, huh, I don't understand this law, this rule. And the priests gather around and go, well, well boss, this is what that, that rule means. This is how we implement that one, how we uh, uh, have a just and moral society, your society. And then if he's doing all these things, God says, and he'll have a, he'll have a dynasty. He'll, he'll have a successful dynasty, a successful lineage. Unfortunately, that's not what we see in the book of Kings. So, um, and, and, and it breaks down straight away, right? David gets to Solomon, who messes up. So it doesn't take long. Yeah, you abandon God. You abandon the, the rules, as simple as they are. Three rules, buddy. Not, not many horses, not many wives, not much money. And we do the opposite, and it gets us into trouble. So, so uh, that's the, the nature of government or good government is actually monarchy. What sort of monarchy is it? It's a limited monarchy and it's a monarchy based around the Bible, right? Because we live in democracy, but we threw the Bible out a long time ago. And, uh, uh, and, and yet somehow we think that that's the best form of government. So that's, that's not the way that, that Moses uh, preferred it. So that was brand new. We'd never seen this before in the text, right? Um, uh, uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, you don't get any of this form of government. Um, but Moses uh, is, needs the people to, to, to prepare themselves. Um, so that's the, 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 the king that we are supposed to have. Then now that we know that uh, the priests and the Levites 
uh, are part of um, a functioning uh, judiciary, you have to take care of them. And uh, so you have to bring in your tithes and your offerings. And what they're going to do is you that's you support your clergy and uh, the and you and this system. Um, but unfortunately, they, they don't always do this. And when you when you get into the prophet Nehemiah, then uh, he Nehemiah goes into the temple and he sees the temple just abandoned. He's like, what is going on? We're all the we're all the Levites. And he asks around. And um, they say, well, people weren't bringing in their tithes and their offerings. And so the Levites had to earn some money. So they've all back, they've all gone to become farmers. And he's like, well, who's taking care of the house of the Lord then? So he gathers all the people and he says, dude, stop it. You go and bring in all the required offerings for the priests and the Levites. We'll bring them back. They're supposed to come and do their job. Um, and so we have to, we have to have the humbleness to actually support our local churches. Right there, 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 uh, if you're listening to this podcast and you're thinking, "Well, I'll, I'm not going to give my tithe to my local church," so ah, imagine what happens if the church has no money. Right, it's not going to do anything. It's not going to. It's not going to speak into the community. It's not going to challenge corruption. It's not going to be able to assist the poor. So we have to make sure that the 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 the, the, the Torah, the Bible, is giving us a vehicle. Of, uh, of effective influence into a society. And that includes okay, the, this, this idea of bringing tithes and offerings into the work of the Lord. And, uh, and so that the, the priests and Levites need to be taken care of. So once we've taken care of the priests and Levites, great. Then you get this messianic prophecy this would never again not had this before this is a new new invention of moses where um when uh, uh when we're looking for the prophet or the coming one um moses is going to say in in chapter 18 uh, starting at verse 17 the lord said to me uh what they say is good i will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I'll put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything that I've commanded him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded, or a prophet who speaks the name of other gods, is to be put to death. So they've, they've got this tension. They've got, God is going to give us prophets. Well, how am I going to recognize one? And what happens if I find a false one? Well, false prophets are dealt with rather harshly, as you can see in the text. Um, do we do that today? No, we don't. <laughs> okay. Uh, but that, and I don't think we're supposed to. I don't think we're supposed to run around and start knocking prophets off with, uh, with, with stones or anything. But we don't. Uh, we're very poor at judging false prophets in our communities. Okay. Um, we often allow them to keep speaking. Uh, instead of saying, actually, that's actually not true. What you've said is, is actually false. This is not a gift from the, from the Lord. You're actually speaking from your own spirit. So please stop. Um, we're, we're very poor at that. Uh, but uh, it's, there's a prophet like Moses that's coming. And uh, this, is the, this is why the Gospels always portray Jesus as the new Moses. Now, Moses has already prepared to pass on his authority to Joshua in the end of Numbers. But it says, I will give him a portion of my spirit. He doesn't give all of his spirit. So Joshua is not the new Moses. And everyone's been waiting for who's the new Moses, who's like Moses, who's the redeemer figure, who's the compassionate one, who's the Torah teacher, who's the miracle worker. I mean, that's what Moses is, right? He's a miracle worker. He did the plagues. He's a teacher of the law. He's actually speaking the words of God. He's a prophet. He's declaring things that even happened before, and uh, and so, and he has some qualities that um, of that we're supposed to be looking for in the heroes of God, and Jesus models all of those. So Moses feeds the people in the desert with manna. Jesus feeds the five thousand. Okay. Um, Moses has a transfigured face. Jesus has a transfigured body. Moses is a Torah teacher, etc., etc. 
And so this is new for us because we haven't had this sort of expectation, this messianic idea that's coming. Notice Moses doesn't say a king is coming, although it's true a king is coming because we're setting up a king. A prophet is coming, right? And so you've got to the, the Messiah has to have a prophetic role as well as a as um, a kingly kingly role. The other interesting thing that this Torah portion brings out is the one that often people judge uh, wrongly and inappropriately the uh, uh, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Measure for measure, and people say, "Oh, we look at look at this dark and dreary um, cult that we've got down there in the desert in the ancient world." Eye for an eye, how horrible! You know, cutting out people's eyes and chopping off people's hands. Although there are some cultures that still do that. Okay, none of them are Jewish, by the way. Um, the uh, but what does it mean, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth? Okay. Uh, when something is wronged and we've gone to the judiciary and we've found out that uh, we have an agreement, that man poked out my eye, what's going to be uh, my recompense and what's going to be his punishment? Um, the uh, This eye for an eye thing is um, uh, open for, no, not open for interpretation. Everything's open for interpretation. It's... Um, they start Jewish people start asking questions. They go, okay, so this man, uh, he had two eyes, and and uh, during a quarrel or some argument, this man uh, damaged this this guy's eye, so he's got one eye. Well, what happens if the the guy who did the 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 deed only has one eye? Right now, do we take his other eye out? And in which case, he's got no eyes. Um, you know, that doesn't seem fair. I mean, this guy, the, the, this guy's still got one eye, but now our dude has only got, only got, got no eyes. So they never did this. This never happened. Okay? What they do is exactly what we do in our modern society. We do monetary compensation. No one in our society does eye for an eye. Right? So like if I smash into Doris's car and we go to court, Doris doesn't smash my car. Like no judge says, you're right, Doris. You're absolutely right. Aaron's a terrible driver. I'm going to take his driver's license away and go smash his car. Okay. What happens? Insurance. We pay money. Okay. You have a work accident. You're at work. You fall over. You hurt your back. You don't go and break your back, your boss's back. No one does that. You actually get monetary compensation. And so, Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth is the metaphor in the ancient world that derives from monetary compensation. What's the value of an eye to these people? And that value might change depending on um, uh, the situation. And so the judiciary are there. You go to the judiciary, you start asking the questions, you, you do this, and then you create a monetary um, uh, uh, compensation, which most cultures do do to this day, right? Uh, the, 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 it's not this horrible thing that's uh, going on. Then um, another thing that's very interesting in, in Moses's uh, last words is how the people of Israel are to participate in warfare. Because chapter 20 says, when you go to war against your enemies, right? Not if. It's it's when, and um, so what happens is uh, he already knows that the people of God are going to have to engage in warfare. In this case, this is real physical warfare. In the realm of the followers of the Messiah, our warfare, as we know, is not against flesh and blood, but it is still a warfare. And, uh, and we have to acknowledge that, that all of us in the household of God are engaged in spiritual warfare, or we should be. We have to acknowledge that we do have an enemy. Like This is like, look at what it says. When you go out to war against your enemies, it's not that, that God says, I'm going to bring you into the promised land, 
No one's ever going to harm you. There's no, it's not going to have any enemies around you. In fact, we're going to build a big wall around Israel and just no one's going to be able to come in. Um, there's going to be enemies. It's already decided. Right? right from word go, you will have enemies. Oh, that's not fair. Sorry, but you got them. And you're going to have to deal with them. Love your enemies. Yes, but they're still your enemies. And this is how you're going to deal with them appropriately. And so you even have rules for warfare, right? It assumes, in this case, violence. Isn't that interesting? The people of God, you're going to have to do violence. You have to do violence. It's not that warfare is fun. It's not clean. It's messy. It's horrible, right? But uh, but you're, when when you're going to have to do it, you're going to have to do it with rules. And uh, and the priests are involved, right? So when you go out to war, you see the enemy. He looks big. He's tough. The demons look big and tough and scary. You, you, you're not sure what to do or how to pray. Well, here you have the priests involved. And um, so they're to come and they're to encourage you uh, morally and spiritually so that you actually can face, face your enemies. Um, so you fight with faith and conviction. That's what this section is. This section is like, if you can't handle it, come back from war. But what we're really wanting is we're wanting soldiers that can face the enemy with faith and conviction. And um, uh, uh, and, and the, the other another aspect of war, particularly for this section physically, it's um is to do with uh, the land. So when you when you besiege an enemy car an enemy town, don't chop all the trees down. Right, it's uh, you know, you don't de deforestate the land. It's not the earth's fault that you're having a tiff with your neighbor, right? So don't punish the earth just because you need to go up and lay siege to a city. It's uh, uh and the, the the a lot of the reasons given here are this is actually your source of food. So don't be an idiot and chop all your fruit trees down. Um, you're going to need to 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 eat. Um, but there is a there, there is a remember we have been instructed by the Lord to have dominion over the earth. Now, dominate uh, uh, can, can have all kinds of connotations, but it doesn't mean destroy, right? Now, I'm going to give an example of what it means that I think dominating the earth can be positive and be used in the right way. So uh, here in Israel, we have um, the lowest point on earth where you can stand up and still breathe called the Dead Sea. Right, lowest point on earth. And in this sea, it's a salt sea, and everything floats. It's all wonderful. And I'm sure most of you, if you've been to Israel, you've been to it. Now, the salts, because it's the lowest point on earth, uh, it evaporates faster than other parts of it. And so the, 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 the sea, the Dead Sea, is shrinking. And people panic about that. And we say, oh, the Dead Sea is shrinking. But that's actually natural. That's what salt seas do all over the world. Salt seas dry up, then they form salt plains and salt flats, and then people come along with high-speed high cars and break land speed records on them. Okay, That's what you do on, on salt flats. So it's completely natural for the Dead Sea to dry up. But we're supposed to have dominion, which means we're allowed to, if we want, put water back in and preserve it and keep it. That's having dominion too. So we're going to do something unnatural. We're going to divert water into the, the Dead Sea. And I think that's a good thing. And I think the Bible allows us to do that. So it's not that when you have a garden, you just let it grow wild. You tend it. You manipulate it. You pull out certain certain plants called weeds you plant certain plants that thrive in that area you're smart you're using your god-given given, given uh, intelligence um and uh, and that's having dominion so i think uh we're we're allowed to do that kind of stuff so so there's this uh net idea that we're going to go out uh, to to war and um and we're going to have to behave properly we're going to have to uh, fight with faith and courage. The priests may be involved, so we're adding an aspect of holiness even to our armed conflict. We're going to preserve the earth when we do so. 
then there's this slightly little uh, interesting um, at the end of the parasha on what's called unsolved murders, where we walk along and we find a dead body and we go, who's to blame for this? And uh, there's this idea of, of getting the, the, the priest together and getting a heifer and doing the ceremony of, um, of, of, uh, of sacrifice that, that says that we didn't do it. What's this whole chapter about? Well, it's about responsibility. It's about responsibility, not just for your own community. It's about responsibility for things that are beyond you. Like you walked outside the city and there was a dead guy. None of us killed him. But we still have responsibility. We have to figure out who did it. We can't figure out who did it. We've got to bury him. We've got to do, we've got to do a, a proper pr pr procedure. So what we're learning is that responsibility also goes beyond ourselves. And, uh, and, there's, and, and we're engaged in that. You, we can't retreat from the world, which is what too many people want to do. We're part of it. And we're meant to be uh, a, a light and a really good witness. So that's the way um, the, uh, the, 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 the parasha ends. Then um, in the, the next one, which is called Kititse, which starts off in Deuteronomy 21.10 and goes through to, to 25.19, it again starts with uh, this phrase, when you go out to war, okay, this idea that armed conflict struggle or in our case spiritual warfare is indeed part of our community um, but these the next this this next torah portion kititse has 74 of the 613 laws in it this is a massive amount of 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 material that moses just dumps on the people of israel okay and he throws out laws after laws and it's in the, you know, that expression, uh, the devil's in the details, God's in the details. So you have a look at each individual law. We'll have a look at a few. We'll be able to have a look at all of them. There's just simply not enough enough time. But it gives us the, uh, the, the, the basis for um, uh, so some of the intention that Moses is setting up uh, for the people of God. So at the beginning part of this, this, um, us uh, Torah portion it talks about what happens when you capture a woman right you know you never seem you never seem to capture men around here um you uh you you go to war and uh you capture you capture take some prisoners which all have to be females and you have to uh can you marry one and uh then the next uh um problem is what happens if you've got two wives and you love one and don't love the other? And then the next rule is on the rebellious son. You've got a son who's really bad, he's always disobedient. What should you do? And uh, the, the rule is kill him. You go, oh my gosh, Moses, this is, this is terrible. You know, people, skeptics come and have a look at our Bible and they go, look at these, these are terrible rules. Please explain this. Okay. Well, the, uh, the sages, the sages uh, look at these texts too, and they they know that the Bible is is a finely crafted text. There's reasons why there's things in certain orders. Um, so let's we can look at them individually, and then we'll look at them as um, a group. So first of all, there is this uh, idea of, of captives. Now these rule this war that we've been talking about in the previous passage and in this passage is not the conquest of the land, because that when you when you went to a war in the land of Israel, what was the rule? Kill everybody, right? There was to be no survivors. Uh, this one, these are not. This is not for the land. This is. We're living in the land of Israel, and the Syrians have decided to make war with us. Okay, so we have a fight, and uh, we win, and uh, now we're allowed to take some of their stuff, and there's rules for that. There's 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 how you divvy up. The, the captured materials that you that you that you some you have to give to the priests you have to give some to the poor you have to give some to the soldiers who didn't go to battle because they were staying behind and guarding and they were just as important as the guys who were fighting everybody got all the rules but what happens if we have a woman then uh, it seems rather strange okay we've got to shave her hair we've got to cut her nails we've got to make her look disheveled and then 
um, you can marry her. And so on one hand, this is terrible. You know, we've killed a husband, we've killed a dad, you know, she's horrible. On the positive side, you know, how can there be something positive about this? She joined the people of Israel in one month. She now believes in the God, the king of the universe. She was a pagan before, but now she's uh, Israelite. So this is the, in the Bible, this is the fastest way to join the household of Israel. And you think, but it's horrible. Yes. But there's also something spiritually positive. Okay? The enemy pagan gods were defeated, and now she's part of the household of Israel. Her children will be part of the household of Israel. Her descendants will be the part of the household of Israel. They may even become kings. Okay? So that's we we have to we can't always look at the here and now. Sometimes we only ever look at things that happen now. We go, oh, it's terrible, and we should never do that. You go, well, wait. There's repercussions that may go on beyond this. Now, there's this incident. A man has two wives. Why has he got two wives in the first place? I don't know. And it says he loves one and doesn't love the other. So typical Jewish commentary, they go, why doesn't he love his wife? What kind of crazy moron marries someone that he doesn't love? And then decides, oh, dang it, I'll go marry somebody else. Um, the, 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 or, or some other rabbis go, what if he doesn't love either of them? I mean, the guy's a complete mess, right? He's just, there's no hope for this, this soul. Um, what, they're, what they're wanting to do is they want to make sure that the unloved person is not neglected. Right, she has to. She she can't be just because people don't love you doesn't mean God doesn't love you. Doesn't mean that God doesn't care or that you're not allowed to have your rights or responsibilities. So we're looking at um, uh, protecting women who from patriarchal persecution, where we're like, oh, I don't love you, so you, I can kick you out. And God says, No, you don't do it that way. That's not the way marriages work. That's not the way our society works around here. She gets her full rights. So what? now we have this rebellious son. What's going on? Why would we uh, 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 want to, to take somebody out? Seems like a really extreme teaching. You know, uh, my kid's bad. And uh, so I take him to the judges and say, look, he doesn't do anything I say. Well, we better stone him. Um, and did they ever do this? And again, there's the sages will say, no. But uh, but what is it actually teaching us? Like, what is the rule teaching? And first of all, they like they link all three stories together into the character of David. And they say, David went out to war. And they take the example of a real biblical event where David goes to war against the king of Geshur. He defeats the king of Geshur. And he captures the daughter of Geshur, and he marries her. Well, that's rule one. And now he's got a bunch of wives, right? He ends up he ends up with eighteen, and so he has to make sure that each one of them is given um, appropriate care. He's not allowed to just throw them away or not care for them. But he ends up with a bad son from this marriage, of Shalom or Absalom. So that's the result. And what they do is they say, look what happens. You do something, it leads to this, and it leads to this. And they say these are all negative. So what they say is, I'll say the Hebrew for us, and you can, and it says, um, Avera gorreret avera. A sin always leads to another sin. Or gorer, it actually means attract, right? A sin always attracts another sin for us to do. But the, the converse is a mitzvah, gorer, it mitzvah. Doing a good deed, what is the reward of doing a good deed? The ability to do another good deed. Right? That's what they say. They say, you did a good deed today? Fantastic. Your reward is the opportunity to do another good deed tomorrow. Right? There's no, no rest for the wicked and there's no rest for the righteous. Okay, So what they're trying to say is um, look at the consequences to actions. Sins only lead to more sins. 
you, there's, there's none of this, um, the end justifies the means. Okay, I'll just keep doing bad stuff and eventually it'll go right. No, it'll never go right. Okay, um, um, but good deeds always lead you to, to do more good deeds. So then, you, then you're always going to be doing good stuff. So for poor old David, it's, it's, it, uh, it didn't come out right. And, um, and so what they're doing is they're having this discussion now is at the end of the story, oh, what do we do with these bad kids? And um, now let's play the game, the if game. What happens if we went on a time machine and we went back in time and we found Adolf Hitler as a two-year-old kid playing in, on a swing? What are we going to do? It's a, it's a moral, moral dilemma, isn't it? And so, you know, what's happening here is the, the, new, the, the, the Bible is looking ahead and they're saying, oh my gosh, this kid is so bad. He's going to kill a lot of people. It's going to hurt a lot of people. The best thing we can do for him right now is actually to knock him off right now. And so it's a, it's a tension and it's in the text. Moses is setting up like this might happen in the future. So be prepared and people have to wrestle with that moral dilemma. Now it's a dilemma and whole university papers have been written on this what would we do if we found Hitler as a small kid? And uh, and so how do we handle sin at its root is the issue. How do we stop it bad at the start? If a sin only ever leads to another sin, how do we switch it so that they're only doing good deeds? And that's what you, why in the in the in the in the old in the Hebrew Bible, there's this massive push for strong families and for people to teach their children and, uh, and, 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 and this very much a love of the family because they know that at the core, you've got to get right to the core first and it's within our families. Okay. And uh, uh, so that's, that's uh, an interesting look at uh, this, this um, set of rules. The, the, then when in, in chapter 22, you have this nice little list of, um, of uh, uh, just one rule after another, which you've actually seen in, in Leviticus and Numbers before, but you end up with coming in with some new laws that we've never seen before, um, including um, the, uh, the, the least of the commandments. Yeah, well, you heard that the, the greatest of the commandments is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and to love your neighbor. Okay, that's the greatest. Well, what's the least? If there's a great one, there has to be a small one. And uh, the, the least is um, in verse uh, 6 of 22. That if you come across a bird's nest beside the road, uh, either on a tree or in the ground, and the mother is sitting on the young or on the eggs, do not take the mother with the young. You may take the young, but be sure to let the mother go so that it may be well with you and you'll have one wife. There are only two commandments out of the 613 that actually tell you the blessing for, for actually doing them. You'll have long life. What's the other one? Honor your mother and father. Right? That whole idea of getting right down to the, to the kernel. It's family. Honor your parents. And, uh, and it, you will have long life. And then the least of the commandments in the entire Bible, egg collecting. Okay? I mean, think about that for a second. We've, this, is, this is how detailed sometimes God gets. Look, when, it, when, you're, when you're going to um, handle nature, even animals have to be taken care of. Right? So you don't, don't I don't, you're not going to, um, you're not going to, uh, cause the mother as much grief as possible. So flap the mother away. She gets scared, she flies off. Then you can take the eggs, right? And have some breakfast. But but you're going to care for, for uh, the mother as well. It's the smallest of the commandments. It's incredibly light, okay? It's just you and an egg and, uh, and, a, and, a, and a bird. But it comes with long life, right? So it's a... It's a 
It's not when you go out to war and you capture a woman, you'll have long life, you know, you know, knock off your bad son, you'll have long life. No eggs. Okay? It's uh, God cares for nature. God cares for that. Even the smallest bits of creation. And, uh, and then from extension, Kalvachoma, things that were small apply to the big. So, at the at the, the 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 beginning kernel is families are incredibly important honor your parents and then everything else comes after that um the, just look after nature and everything else will come after after that uh as well you get uh in this commandment you also get um this this commandment that don't plant two types of seeds uh in the same ground you're like, man, alive. You know, there's a lot of agrarian culture here. Like, uh, what what are these rules saying? So, in Jewish exegesis, uh, you have the literal, okay, um, but you also have the uh, the, the the figurative. Um, that is, the uh, literally don't plant two types of seeds in the same field. Okay, so don't plant barley and wheat together. Um, farmers would already tell you that's a dumb idea. But on the spiritual, like, what does it actually mean? What are they trying to say? And the rabbis will say this. They'll go, you know what? God cares for nature. He cares for little seeds. They're so small. He doesn't want us to put wheat and barley together because these two crops require different amounts of water, different amounts of sunshine, different amounts of nutrients. We're going to make these seeds compete with each other. And God doesn't want that. <clears throat> God doesn't want us to make nature compete with itself now if god cares for seeds of plants calvachoma which means light to the heavier how much more does he care for human seeds if he cares for plants he must also care for human seeds what are human seeds Okay, fertilized eggs. So unborn cares for the unborn. Don't harm the unborn. That's what that's what the rabbis get from this this passage. Don't plant two seeds in your in your field. Care for the unborn. Scratch your head. How did you get there? That's how they get there. And they're looking at the text and they're working out if we care for the smallest of creation, we must also care for the highest of creation, and that's human life. We must care for human life. We must care for the for when it's the smallest, which is the seed. And it's within this uh, within this passage that you also get the, which is all about agrarianism, that you get Deuteronomy twenty two twelve, which is make tassels, sit seat. Now, when you make sit seat here, there's no reason given. Okay, just make sit seat, and it's within agrarianism. It's all about uh, looking after the earth. Whereas the actual double pat the, the passage about it in um in Numbers, Numbers 15, 38, 39, you actually get the reason for Sitzit, which is where, where Moses says, make Sitzit so that you can remember the commandments. Here there's no nothing. It's just make Sitzit. And uh and, and you and you why? And it's it's lumped in with all of these small commands that have incredible weight long life looking after eggs um uh caring for for nature so it doesn't compete with itself um uh being being spilling over into care for the unborn and then um make sure you've you, you put these cords on yourself so that you remember all these things uh and then um the the you also get this idea of um respecting the dead that uh when people die like you don't um uh if this is where you get the the idea of if someone don't don't leave the people hanging on a tree okay this idea of respecting the dead bury bury the dead care for the land so there's not polluted and 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 full of of of, of death the, the land is also holy and has to be pure we sometimes forget that now that doesn't mean we should all become greenies and tree huggers. That's good, because we have to remember that God made the world and He says it was good. He's asked us to care for it. Okay, but that doesn't mean we should, at the expense of humans. Right? That's the other. That's the other problem. Is sometimes we have become to worship trees 
than uh, than God. We have dominion, right? But we should also remember that the land is pure and holy, and we have a connection to it. And uh, if the people are going to be holy, the land must also be holy. And so, so the, there is a this. There's also this idea of um, taking care of um, uh, uh, the the earth, and that includes um, uh, burying the dead and making sure that they're okay. Um, there is one other thing I'll do before we. Oh, there's the two more things. One is um, the laws of divorce. Now, this is a is a is a problem in our society. As soon as people start getting married, they will eventually also get divorced. It's unfortunately inevitable, and um, and the, the um, a mechanism was set in place, and so Moses had prepared the people. And and so you 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 write a certificate uh, of divorce, and that people can can go their their separate ways. So this, of course, led to lots of exegesis. Um, when is when when does that happen, and what are the are the grounds? Because there, there's no real uh, grounds for divorce that are listed here. So there were in in, in Jewish tradition, you had people who took the more heavier uh, path, saying no one's allowed to get divorced. Which you find in the Christian world today too. Yes, there are some people who say nope, can't happen. Right? And then there are people who took the lighter way in Judaism, where they said, "Well, you know, um, just wake up in the morning, she burns your toast. That's it. She's out." Okay. Go, oh my gosh, that's a bit, a bit rich. Okay. Um, and so there was a bit double streams, um, which of course you see that in our society today too, right? What do you have? No fault divorce. You don't even have to have a reason anymore in the modern world. We often look at the Bible and we say, "Oh, it's terrible." Just look at them, you know, what a complete unjust society. And we realize, guys, we're doing it today. We have a no fault divorce. You can come to a judge and say, "I want a divorce," and the judge says, "Why?" Says, "I don't have to tell you." He goes, "You know what? Yep, you're right. You don't. So none of my business." Um, and uh, and that's the society we're at. But what is the intention here? And so um, what you find is in uh, yeah, there is a Jewish community uh, that that, uh, that used to live out in the desert called the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And um, when they were reflecting on this Torah portion, they wrote down that uh, that in the beginning, God made them male and female. Right. And that's their phrase. In the beginning, God made the male and female, and that's that's where we start out our marriage discussions from, and that's exactly how Jesus did it. When he was asked, "When are we allowed to get divorced?" Right, people are having a discussion. They're, they're looking at the Torah portion, and Jesus starts saying it in exactly the same way of his day. Don't you know that in the beginning, God made the male and female, and uh, and he 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 looked at the world and he said, "It is not good that man should be alone." Right, uh, he didn't say that it's not good for women to be alone because obviously you know, men are useless and they can't do anything without a woman. Um, and so we get these, we get this, this, this coupling. And so sometimes those couplings don't work. And even Jesus said it, they don't always work. And there was this, there were these these the these you you can get divorced for for, for like adultery, right? Uh, things like that. There were, there were, there were, there were, there are ways where we we acknowledge that in the beginning God made the male and female, but also sometimes it breaks down, and it's not nice. No one's saying this is a good thing, uh, 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 but it's not the unforgivable sin. That's something that our culture and our as a Christian society we need to we need to understand that uh, people who have gone through divorce they're hurting. They're they're not in a good place, and they need our love, they need our support, and uh, and and blessing, and they certainly don't need to be made to feel like second class citizens, okay? Because that's not coming either from Jesus, and it's certainly not coming from Moses either. What we're what we're doing is we're trying to set up a way that we can actually protect people, uh, uh, that they get their full rights, and 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 uh, and, and men are still having their responsibility to uh, to protect uh, their their ladies. But what was the initial creation for people to be in pairs? Okay, that's the ideal, right? That's uh, that's 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 what both Jesus and and uh, 
the, the Dead Sea community were looking at. So in the beginning, God made males and females, and they're meant to be together. Okay, um, That doesn't mean they're always going to be there, but it does mean that was the, the ideal. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say is that at the end of this Torah portion, in chapter 25, uh, verse 17 to 19, you get out of the 613 laws, three of them are to do with Amalek. Right? People say, oh, you know, the 613 laws, they're always so hard, I can't do them all. Well, many of them have to do with people you've never heard of. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. So remember who Amalek is. Amalek is the nation that came out to enslave Israel after they had been liberated from the land of Egypt and uh, in Exodus 17. And God says, I'm going to have war with Amalek from generation to generation. This is terrible that you would come and try and defeat me. I've set my people free and you want to make them slaves again? No, no, no. You're actually going to war against God and his plans here. So Moses says to the people of Israel, remember what Amalek did to you along the way you came out of Egypt. When you were weary and worn out, they met you on the journey and they attacked all who were lagging behind. We That's not in Exodus 17. This is a new piece of information that Moses has given. Right? He's saying that Amalek came out and they were picking up all the weak and the stragglers, all the people that were at the back of the camp. He says, so don't forget. Right? Remember the bad guys. And and let's put this on a spiritual level because you always got to remember the, 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 the literal. Remember what Amalek did, but also you got to go down to the spiritual. Let's remember we have an enemy. And who does he go for? He goes for the weak. He goes for the ones that are lonely, the ones that are, are on the fringe of our community. And we've got to protect them because he'll go for them. And uh, what Moses is saying is, don't you forget what the bad guy does. And because we do, we forget. And we, then we, we, get, we get together in our communities and we go, oh, we're doing a really good. Oh, well, where's Bob? Oh, Bob doesn't come. He's very shy. We should just leave him on his own. Well, the enemy will go come and get Bob. And like, well, that can't happen. We've got to go phone him up. We've got to send him a letter. We've got to contact him. We've got to make sure he's okay. We've got to pray spiritual covering over him so that the enemy stays away and that he gets his extra angelic guardians too. All right. Now, uh, what else do we have to say? When the, when the Lord your God gives you rest from all your enemies around in the land he has given you to possess, you shall blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. You will not forget so three rules remember what amalek did don't you forget what amalek did and when you find him you go get him right what does jesus say about the gates of hell the gates of hell will not prevail right you know um uh you beat the enemy you you beat him you find out where he is and you you let him have it and lord lord i need your angels to go to go defend it. spiritual warfare when you go out to your enemies in battle, we are engaged in spiritual warfare. We just are. And, uh, and it's not a defensive war, right? We, we're, we're on the winning side. We have the King of Kings. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the angels. We do not give the enemy rest. And he needs to be confronted and, uh, and uh, challenged, um, not 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 in in terms of us being scared, but in terms of us being bold. So this is uh this is Moses getting his people in in the land of Israel, in the land of Moab, gonna go into the land of Israel. Make sure you get your judiciary right, make sure that the priests, make sure the word of God is part of your uh judiciary system so that you actually have that that God is part of your the way you make laws. Uh, make sure that your executive, your king, make sure you have a king. Make sure he's not too powerful. You limit him. Make sure he's also involved in reading the Bible and understands my word. And you can lead the people right. Then there's a whole bunch of laws of how you deal with the land, how you deal with uh, 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 women, how you deal with divorce, how you, do, you, you name a rule that they start popping up, even the small ones like the eggs, but it comes with life. Okay? The, 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 the word of God is life. 
It's not death. It's not. It's not something negative. It's not something that burdens you. It's actually, something liberating. Um, uh, it it uh, it's, it sets people sets people free. And then Moses gets his people together and says, "And, and remember, you've got a bad guy. Don't forget the bad guy." It's very easy to forget when you go in and you, you get successful and um, and you've got your nice big house now and uh, the crops look good. Suddenly you realize, oh, we don't have an enemy. And we, and that's, that's one of the devil's tricks when you think that he's not there. right? And, and, and we've got it in the world. you know. We, we believe in God. We believe in angels. Demons? No, they don't exist. The devil? He doesn't exist. Hell? No, not a real place. And suddenly you realize, wow, oops. Now he starts picking people up from the end from the edges. And uh, and when that's not we those are the people we have to care for. We have to care for the 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 widows and the strangers. Okay. So the, you can always judge a society by how it cares for its weakest members. So that's uh, our Torah portions for the for the day. They're absolutely packed, and Moses is beginning to bring in little new pieces of information and of course don't forget deuteronomy 18 there's someone like me coming and uh, the new moses which as we know and has been presented in the gospels that's jesus of nazareth he was the coming one all right well but ladies unmute yourselves and we'll have a little discussion if you will Aaron, yes, I uh, I really enjoyed this, and I what I got out of it, and from both the Torah portions was about the weak, um, how you know how it's really important to care for the weak, and uh, Moses was one of those, and um, you know, and how Amalek, like he came up from behind and he attacked the weak, you know, and yeah. And I, it, I really kind of identify with Moses in a lot of different ways, but I love that he cared for the weak, you know, Excellent. and, and yeah. that's kind of something that I do as well. So. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Well, Linda, yeah, that's a, uh, uh, if, if, if there's anything we ever learn, it's exactly that is what is true religion. Cause it's in, it's in the book of James as well as in um, the old Testament. True religion yeah. is caring for the widows and the orphans, right? The, yeah. the the weak ones. And and you're right, that's how Moses started his life. As a weak, <laughs> miraculous little floating on the river baby. Uh, yeah. He he yeah. didn't didn't do so well at the start, but boy, he finished well. Yeah. And I want to finish well too. I want to finish well as well. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And another thing was um, you know, what you talked about, God is giving he gave them the land but even though they gave he gave them the land they had to fight for it still and you know god just doesn't hand us things and say oh here here you know we still have to do our part right yeah yes we do yeah um yeah it's very easy you know to disparage other generations <laughs> um <laughs> but uh one of one of the issues that generation z has this is our you know all the people who are born to technology is uh, yeah. they're, born, they're born to technology right they were given a world where everything's at the at the click of a button yeah and um that's a blessing it's an unbridled blessing you know but it's <laughs> unbelievably dangerous very and you can see it within christianity where People love Jesus, but they don't love anybody else. You know, and you know, oh my gosh, how do we get there? Because everything's just given to them. So we have to we have to be careful with the and 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 you know families are incredibly important, children are incredibly important. We can see it in the text. Uh, uh, but you you there is something for working for your bread. Um, yeah. that that so it's good it's good um we come from a generation that had to work <laughs> yeah really everybody that the, every, yes we had to work 
And um, while farming has gotten easier, you still it's work, right? The, the yeah. crops don't get in the ground themselves. They don't get out of the ground themselves. So, right. yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was great, Aaron. Just just packed full. I was amazed uh, at the uh, judiciary and how it was set up, which is uh, all the same words that we have today. However, we have not followed it. And in a lot of the uh, judiciaries, I used to work in justice. <laughs> in, in, all, in, all the, uh, uh, in all the legislation, there used to be something even in the uh, judiciary was in God we trust. And we even right. used to have that on, on bills, on money, in yeah. God we trust. And it's not there anymore. So yeah. what has happened? And but the judiciary and the structure that has been uh, defined in the Bible is very much what uh, the way it it is designed today as well. The only thing is we don't follow it because we make all kinds of legislation and rules against what it is we originally had. Yes. The throughout, and this is the first time I've actually heard that uh, and and this was really enlightening to me about divorce uh there there are uh times when people do divorce for good reason yep. but there are many people who actually uh will not go there because yep. in the bible uh it's a covenant a marriage covenant that is not to be broken so that's a real uh push and pull so it is. you know yeah and I, and I appreciate Moses for not shying away from it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And because sometimes like we as a community, we just sometimes just don't know how to deal with it. Yeah. And it's really sad. Um, and people mm -hmm. can, can become incredibly judgmental over, uh, over this issue. And, the, and we shouldn't. You know, what's the phrase? Mourn with people who mourn. Rejoice with people who rejoice. That's the, right. Um, and I just I was reading someplace that uh, the Great Commission is the great offer from God to be in partnership with him. Mm -hmm. So we always have to be in partnership. We can't expect God to do everything. Right. Yes. And part. I was having this discussion just yesterday. There was a, a, a pilgrim, lovely believer who who was journeying and uh, she came to ask she says why doesn't why doesn't god just write his name on the sky so that everybody knows he's there you know why yeah. why doesn't the world believe and you're like okay well imagine this imagine that the lord sends an angel to everyone on the planet right now everyone on the everyone immediately got an angel appearing right in front of them and the angel said aaron hello Get off the floor. Uh, there is a God, loves you very much, and Jesus is the Messiah. Thanks. Everybody. Yeah. What would be the result? Would people all now believe in God? This is what would happen. Oh, I think I've had a I think I've had too much coffee. I can't trust <laughs> what I've just seen. Or they'll go like this. That's not from Allah. That's a demon. Right, oh. we've got to get everybody who believes that that was true. Like, even <laughs> though you literally had the truth put in front of your face, you'll deny it, and yes. you'll be back to where you are right now. And so, God, in His wisdom, and because He's the smartest person on the planet, universe, He knows. You know, the best people to care for my Earth are humans. I'll okay. get them to do it. You know, mm -hmm. they'll have a special relationship. You know, the best people to actually share the gospel are humans. I'll give them my spirit to help, and they'll go out and share the gospel, um, you know, and and it's the best way. Why? don't know. But God's a lot smarter than, <laughs> than yeah. us. And I just had a question. Uh, caring for the weak. And so that, because of course, Satan does get after the weak immediately. Is that one of the reasons for 
intercession. Is that an intercessory oh, absolutely. sort of uh, Remember, yeah. our, our warfare is not against yeah. uh, flesh and blood. So yeah. we have to remember, we are engaged in a warfare. Start into praying. And who do we start with praying for? The weak first. Protect the yeah. weak. The strong are strong. We can, and we can pray for them too, right? <laughs> Lord bless our kings. Lord bless our judges. Lord bless our shepherds with preaching the truth, etc., etc. But always remember the weak, the lonely, the bereaved, the suffering, all the people that we so often want to forget because it's a little difficult, um, you know, but they're the ones we actually have to to pray for and so that the enemy uh, can't mm -hmm. get at them. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. All righty. Well, lovely people. Great. Good stuff. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Blessings, oh, ladies. Lovely learned lady. something new. <laughs> Thank uh, you. <laughs> so who, who's coming out uh, in October? Fantastic. Oh, Doris, you coming oh, back? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, <laughs> Good. Wow. Uh -oh. my, fr my friend wants to go, and okay. uh, I'm going with her. Brilliant. Do, yeah. do we know how many people are coming? Uh, I, I don't. But um, but but Melody can tell us soon. She's in uh, she's in Saskatoon right now. She is okay. Yeah. She's had a okay. session tonight. Yeah. 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 We'll it's send so her our awesome. blessing and uh, yeah. so, lady. She'll ask. Ready? She'll ask what it was all about. I <laughs> may I just ask a question? Where is last week's parasha? I was looking every day. I go on and look for it, and it's not there yet. No, I put it up in um, in upload. Where did, where did you put? Oh, so it should. So it's in the uh, in the Google Drive then. It should be yes. So what happens is um this this like as soon as I click uh, stop, it'll it'll um okay collate it, everything and then tomorrow. Oh no, actually it's today already. Um, yeah. I will click. I'll give it a title and I'll send it up to uh, Aaron's uploads or something like that. Okay, I'm going to go and get it then. Okay. And then go to YouTube. New YouTube. Yeah. Did it go on YouTube? Uh, I'm not quite sure where it will be. But then then I think <laughs> I think I think what happened I was then, for it too. then they just put a little uh, editor on either side or something like that and then it's up. I have to look again. Yeah. So yeah, just, remember, you... just remember just remember just uh, remember a, a great line which we always need to remember tradition is the voice of our ancestors these right. these this voice that we are hearing from our forefathers okay um is speaking to us through the through 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 these traditions which we are which we guard and keep how do we keep these things we, we create these traditions and uh that protects protects preserves guards shepherds emboldens empowers you know you name an adjective probably does it um so good thing all right thank you great oh, thank you shabbat shalom everyone have a great okay shabbat shalom thanks erin god bless hello to the family will yeah. do